Greetings, brothers and sisters, and welcome to Lesson 6 of How Change Happens, the introductory course in the Certificate Program in the Foundation and Practice of Pastoral Counseling. This lesson is entitled, Applying the Paradigm to Vignettes. This lesson will be a little longer than our usual video presentations because it contains three counseling scenes in which David Pallison talks to his five-year-old daughter. He applies the model to some troubling experiences that she has without actually teaching the model to her. In this lesson, we will clarify what a vignette is and see how these small segments of life can point the way to applying our model to bigger life issues. Next, we'll watch how David Pallison applies our model in three conversations with his five-year-old daughter. And finally, we'll see the significance of repentance as a lifelong need for change throughout life. Let's begin with part one of lesson six. Vignettes are import an important tool for learning how to counsel ourselves and others. Vignettes are small segments or scenes of what's happening in someone's life. They are just a slice of life. They occur in just a few seconds or minutes. We use vignettes to learn how to apply our model to change to the larger scenes of life by applying them to these smaller, more manageable scenes. I'll begin this lesson with a, a personal vignette. It actually takes longer to describe here than the length of the experience. I've entitled the vignette, Ah, the Peacefulness of the Park for a Sunday Time of Meditation. I love the country, mountains, trees, and fields. I was raised on a farm on the side of a mountain. But I came to college in Philadelphia in 1965 and have been living in urban areas ever since. Consider the situation, the heat that presents itself to me. We live in the city of Chester, near Chester Park, a beautiful multi-acre area of fields and trees and the Ridley Creek running through it. There are park benches scattered around the perimeter of the park, and one of these is less than 100 yards from our front door. I love going over there just to sit and to read and to meditate. One comfortably warm Sunday afternoon, I decided to go to the park and read. I was enjoying the quiet, worshiping God as the creator of this beauty and reading and meditating peacefully. Now right behind the bench that I was sitting on is a small parking area with about a half dozen spaces for vehicles, maybe 20 feet behind me. While I was enjoying the peacefulness, an SUV pulled up into the parking spot directly behind the bench I was on. The driver decided to let his truck run at a rumbling idle with his window down and his radio loudly playing music on a popular rock station. Now consider the thorns. My reaction, I'm getting irritated as he continues to let his truck rumble and the music play. My irritation turns to aggravation and annoyance. I'm tempted to become angry, to turn around and glare at the driver, hoping he'd get the message to quiet things down. Maybe I should get up and go over and, and ask him to turn the SUV off and his radio down. Maybe I should stand up and yell or wave at him uh, from where I'm sitting. My heart at the moment is not thinking in terms of who God is in the situation or who I am in Christ or how my Savior wants me to be like him in this redeemed, as his redeemed child. Rather, I'm thinking about what I want, a peaceful place with quiet as it was when I came here. I'm thinking he has no right to interfere with my solitude. Of course, there's nothing wrong with wanting a peaceful place, is there? But it's what happens to that want in my heart that is the problem. It begins to transform into a demand, a strong desire. Maybe some would say a need. At least it's my right to be here without this selfish disturbance, isn't it? Now consider the cross. By the grace of God, I know what is happening inside of me, and I begin to reflect on who God is in this situation. He's good. He's in control. He knows me, and He knows what I need at the moment. He loves me and intends interruptions in my life to be for my good and His glory. He also is in charge of this man and his car. He may not know the Lord of peace, and this may be as close to peacefulness as He gets. I have an inheritance of peacefulness that Christ allows me to begin to enjoy now and that will increase exponentially for eternity. I also begin to reflect on who I am in Christ. He wants me to be content with Him in the midst of turbulence, confusion, disquiet, interruptions to my comfort. He wants me to be satisfied with His love and the mission I have, the privilege of being part of uh, to people who have no peace. 
he's reminding me that peace is an inner condition because of his love and acceptance of me. This man's need of Christ is the same as mine. Now the fruit. I repent. I ask the Lord Jesus to make me content with what really matters and rejoice in Christ and the peace that he provides. I pray for the man and the opportunity to speak to him as a, a friend without making any request about his SUV or his music. I try to resume my reading with the truck rumbling and the music playing and not be bothered or distracted seriously by it. Before I can speak to him, he very shortly puts his SUV in gear, backs up and leaves the park. Quiet has returned. Perhaps the Lord's purpose for this man in my life has just been fulfilled by reinforcing my contentment because of Christ with God's providence in my life. Keep in mind the key characteristics of vignettes since you are using them to help you understand and, and apply a model for change. First, vignettes are brief scenes from your life to which you apply the model. These simple scenes set the stage for applying the model to larger, more complex problems. My park bench experience lasted a very short time. It was a short video clip of my heart's interaction with a real-life encounter. Vignettes are like a garage for applying the tools of change to the big things, like major engine work, as well as less complicated things like putting air in my tires. Second, vignettes are examples of starting places to apply the model with simple, common, daily kinds of struggles. Often, the popular TV and other counselors of notoriety begin with big stuff, major betrayals, abuse, failure with my kids, getting fired from my job, relatives who won't talk to me but scheme and to hurt me. Now these get lots of attention, but in the epistles and in Jesus' ministry, the Bible usually comes at life's problems from another direction. The Bible does deal with the big stuff, raising someone from the dead, turning a murderer into an apostle, making a major thief into a generous giver. But typically the epistles and the gospels are applied to common everyday sins. Favoritism, wanting to be the greatest, greed, selfishness, fears about food and clothing, who will pick as our leader, keeping your word, use of money and time. This is where most of us live. 1 Corinthians 10.13 speaks of common temptations that God provides help for. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but will with the temptation also pride provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Earlier in the same chapter in verses 6 to 12, Paul shows us that temptations that the temptations the Corinthians faced were not much different at the heart level from the idolatry, adultery, and grumbling that the Israelites faced in the wilderness. That's why Paul uses the, Il the, Il the Israelites as an example of vulnerability to temptation and sin for the Corinthians. We're pretty much the same. In other words, Paul concludes, you Corinthians aren't much different from those people. You have much in common with them. Have the humility to be on the alert for the common temptations. Trust your Father for deliverance and not your own strength and resources. Your temptations might dress up differently, but at the heart level, there is a lot in common. In our modern day, for example, you may never have been a drug addict, but there probably have been times when you've eaten a whole bag of potato chips, inhaled a pint of chocolate ice cream, sat in front of the TV or scarfed down a bag of M&Ms to feel better or get a moment of pleasure or comfort after a difficult conversation or encounter or a failure of some sort or somebody's criticisms. The drugs and the TV, potato chips or ice cream are a long way apart, yet at the heart level, use of them is pretty close, a way to find relief or pleasure in a hard life. These vignettes are like a young child's puzzle with huge pieces and even indentations and for the specific shapes. Later, you graduate to the 4,000 piece puzzle or the ones with pictures on both sides. If you understand the small ones, you really understand how to do the big ones. There's more complexity, but the process is pretty much the same. Start with the experiences that God brings to your attention. You can apply the eight questions or the three trees to nearly any situation. 
They are only a summary or outline of the features of how God changes people in small areas and in giant life-shaking ones. If you are having a conversation with a friend and she identifies some relatively small heat settings that she is battling with, help her, with, help her to apply the model's truths to that experience. You may know that there are bigger fish to fry in her life, bigger, more serious problems to address, but you can begin where she wants to begin. This will allow God to give you greater access to helping her as, you, as your concern strengthens your relationship and her trust in you grows. Any event in an occasion is an occasion to take your friend to the cross. As we break for the end of this part of the lesson, Lesson 6, you'll be led by your mentor to talk, take about 15 minutes to share with each other in a small group vignettes that you brought to class. Your goal is to show the group how you applied one of the model versions, the three trees or the eight questions, to your experience. The group can help you think your way through your vignette if you get stuck. Your mentor will circulate and also help out. Spend most of your time talking about questions 3, 5, and 6, especially your desires and, and, when, uh, and who God the Father is and who God the Son is in your situation. Turn the DVD player off and after 15 minutes, then return. Welcome back. How did your vignette sharing go? Don't be discouraged if it didn't go too well. You'll discover that as you do several of these, your ability to apply the model will greatly improve. As I noted earlier, vignettes are the garage where we work on these things. In part two of lesson six, you're going to see Dr. David Pallison, the author of this course, as it has been taught for the last 30 years by the Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation, literally all around the world. Dr. Pallison describes three brief conversations about situations his five-year-old daughter Gwen had faced. Gwen gave permission to him to uh, share these vignettes. You should follow these three encounters in your workbook. Make notes along the way about the ways you see Dr. Pallison using the elements of the biblical model of change. At the end of the video, turn off the video player and talk about what you've observed about the model as her dad talked with his daughter. Now let's watch Dr. Pallison talk about the three vignettes or scenes of conversations he had with his five-year-old daughter Gwen. After the video, your mentor will turn off this uh, presentation uh, to discuss what you've seen. Your workbook has some thoughts about the three vignettes that you may want to consider as well. This is a story of, uh, from Gwyneth's life, uh, oh, probably 20 plus years ago, uh, 1988, I assume, if she was five. Uh, another thing about vignettes, kind of like the Clyde case study, every detail matters. The details matter. Life is lived in the particulars and uh, the uh, so let me jump in with vignette number one. It was late spring, uh, towards the end of the kindergarten school year. She was in kindergarten. And the, um, it was a Sunday morning, early June. And I had gotten up early, and I was sitting at the kitchen table eating breakfast. And I was eating a bowl of Muslick cereal. Now you say, like, why does that matter? <laughs> But it actually, for the vignette, the fact that it was music cereal matters. I'm eating a bowl of music cereal. Gwen comes into the kitchen. Uh, and if I'm sitting there, she's, she, she walks in the kitchen. She stops about eight feet away from the breakfast table. And she is staring at my cereal bowl. Now, my wife is the one in our family who has radar. You know, I'm the one that. If I had been responsible for their medical care, they'd all be dead because I don't ever notice there's a problem until there's green fluids coming out of orifices and that sort of thing. Whereas Nan is the one that notices that at three in the morning when a child three rooms away goes <coughs> in the middle of the night, she's instantly awake and on top of it. And uh, so I don't tend to be Mr. Like notice stuff, but... <laughs> I'm eating my breakfast, and I did notice that this is kind of strange behavior for my energetic, friendly five-year-old to be standing eight feet away staring at my cereal bowl. So I asked this profound counseling question. I said, what's up, Gwen? Now, 
that is a profound counseling question, isn't it? I mean, it's the, it's the archetypal, what's happening? Right? It's, that, it's the most simple, like, draw you out, find out what's going on in your life. And her answer was very interesting. She, um, she said, uh, it's four words, I told a lie. Now, you know, here we are, 15 seconds into you know, this little 7.30 in the morning, Sunday morning, and all of a sudden you've got a very significant sort of thing unfolding. Um, if you were minded to think that the totality of how we grow is identify the behavioral sin and call to righteousness, we actually have all that we need to know already, right? We have the sin. God calls us to repent, and he calls us to tell the truth. So conceivably, if, if biblical transformation and change were just thorns to fruit, the, con- the, the conversational part of the, of the counseling has, and, the, and, the, and the getting to know you part has ended. But, you know, you immediately realize, like, no way. There's so much more going on. And similar, you know, to what was very complex in Clyde, where you had these marquee sins and struggles, but then we said, at a certain point early in the case study, we said, we still don't know the man or his world. Well, it's very similar uh, with a five-year-old. And uh, I, asked a follow, I asked a question. I said, well, what, what was the lie? Um, what did you say? And she said, I told Anne that I hate Muslix when really I love it. Now, I can't say that I was super illumined at this point in the conversation, but you can see how, you know, in the, the darkness of two people trying to make sense of each other's lives, all of a sudden, pieces are coming into play. I don't know anything about what happened or the context or why she did, but I do know something about her situation. Anne is her best friend. Uh, we had lived with Anne's family for the uh, first uh, five years of Gwen's life uh, in a duplex. Uh, and so Anne's a very significant person in, in Gwen's life uh, uh, as a child. And, and I found out the content of the lie, although it didn't completely make much sense uh, so far. So again, another <laughs> profound counseling question. Uh, what, uh, what happened? Like, what was going on? And the whole story tumbles out and she says, well, I was at Anne's house, and Anne said, I hate Muslix. And so I said, I hate Muslix, because I didn't want her to not like me. And all of a sudden, this story, you know, this little vignette, it just explodes off the page. And you, and you can see how, in the... Con- in the uh, terms that we have been looking at, we have got this, we have this situation where I now know the the lie, right? I know what that is, right? A lie is a falsehood interpersonally. I know that it was her friend, her best friend, someone who's a very significant player, and her friend had a strong opinion about a non-moral issue, right? Whether you like or dislike music cereal is is indifferent, but this valued friend uh, didn't like it. Uh, We also know and, and, and this is so often, you know, there are people in this class who will struggle with question three. They'll struggle with, how do I make sense of what's proper to know about the human heart? Or how can you figure out your motives and such, and given the morass of the human heart? But we have actually heard in her words her reason, and that she was afraid. Oops, I hit the wrong button, but she was afraid of rejection. Uh, oh, I know, in fact, her, her, uh, her particular, she, she actually had a, a specific word there. It was like, I was afraid Anne would think I was stupid, would say I was stupid. 
And um, the, uh, that is a category. That, that naive comment from her, she has actually revealed something very profound about the human heart, not even knowing that she's done it, right? I mean, the Bible would talk about that as fear of man, that not meaning the emotion of fear, you know, the emotion of fears would be part of thorns, but the fear of man is a religious orient, core orientation to take your cues off of other people. Um, the, uh, and uh, we also have some other things going on in this particular story right from the start. For example, there are some hugely significant good fruit that has already been on the table. She has come and been honest about a lie. And you think about that, how that is a profound, unusual, wonderful starting point that to actually say I told a lie. It, uh, so there's honesty already coming <coughs> forth. There's also something which I, uh, I'll, I'll put it down more towards, and this will help even see some of the ambiguity in making a discrete cut between vertical and horizontal. You also see here the operations of her conscience. And she has a conscience that is doing two things that are absolutely spectacular. That conscience is accurate, and that conscience is active, right? And again, you think about liars, how the conscience gets seared and blinded, and people self-deceive, and they lie to themselves, and their conscience actually eventually goes, it goes dead, or relatively dead. And, but you've got a young girl here whose conscience is alive, and it's cued to the right set of standards, telling a lie is wrong. Uh, if she had come up and said, you know, uh, I wore a pink dress today and I should have worn a green one, the conscience would have been distorted. But you've got a clear conscience, accurate, and you've got one that is active. There's also uh, another factor that was more implicit in it. And it's, it's part of why she was propelled internally to actually talk with me as her father. And it's the fact that every, every lie creates distance in relationship, right? And so here's her best friend, but because she's told a lie, there's an estrangement that has come into her relationship with Anne. And the, uh, the sweet, open, back and forth, enjoy each other play of five-year-old life has been seriously disrupted uh, by what has happened uh, uh, in this little event. Now, where do we go with it? And uh, I'm not gonna, I, I won't give the, he said, she said every blow by blow, but I was honored by my daughter's trust. I could understand what she was dealing with. I know it's something that, uh, that God really cares about and speaks to. It's something that the mercies of Christ uh, are uh, intended to, to address. Uh, basically, w where we went, and I'll be a little bit more shorthand, but in the back of my mind was Proverbs 29, 25. A couple of reasons in that. Uh, one is that you know, the Proverbs are designed for children. They're small, bite-sized, portable, pithy. And this particular proverb, uh, just a, it, it's a wonderful shorthand of, of this entire, or, you might say the, the, it orients us to the entire struggle that Gwen is having as a five-year-old. The fear of man lays a snare. But he who trusts the Lord is safe. So it has both a, that proverb has both a, you might say a diagnosis half, and it has a liberation and solution half to it. It talks about the human heart, 
fear of man versus trust in God. It talks about implicitly the gospel in that what does it mean that we're safe if we trust God? It, you know, it's not the you know, X, Y, and Z of Christ died for your sins, but it's the larger framework of his goodness, his mercy, his kind intention. And um, now, from a communication, you know, notice I put it in brackets, uh, from a communication standpoint, Fear of man is not a phrase that's going to make much sense to a five-year-old, is it? Because a five-year-old is concrete. And is to think about the phrase fear of man demands a degree of abstraction. For example, it's not talking about males. It's talking about people. It's not even talking about fear so, so much as an emotion, which is how we all take it naturally. But it's talking about a, a religious core orientation. So the communication went something like this. Um, well, I started out by just saying, you know, I'm so glad you talked, you brought this up, and I can really understand what you're going through, because we all deal with this. And, you know, and the Bible says that when we are too concerned with what other people think about us, we get stuck, we get trapped, and we trip, and life really gets confusing uh, from there. You, know, you can see that, I mean, I'm basically paraphr I'm not quoting but chapter and verse, because saying the words Proverbs 25, 20, 29, 25 was meaningless to a five-year-old. I'm not using the quote of the phrase fear of man, but I'm just, I'm, I'm operationalizing it for a five-year-old, right? When we're too concerned with what other people think about us. And the word snare is not gonna make any sense to her, but the fact that we become trapped and we trip and we feel stuck and we feel far away from people that we should feel close to. Those are all things that that snare uh, operationalizes into her particular world. Um, I said, you know, I, I know what that's like. Um, and Jesus will help you. And we can ask Jesus to for, for forgiveness, and he will help you. Now, that was my shorthand for a five-year-old of he who trusts the Lord is safe. Uh, again, uh, this is not going to be a conversation where uh, certain doctrines, which are absolutely foundational to a mature adult understanding of God's grace and why he's trustworthy, those aren't going to be speaking to a five-year-old at this point, but... She needs to know that Jesus will be merciful to her and that he will help her. And we can ask him, we can ask Jesus to forgive us. You can ask, we, we can ask Jesus to forgive you and to help you. And the entire conversation probably lasted seven minutes. And we prayed together. And, you know, she in a, a childlike way and, and I in a, hopefully a childlike way, uh, uh, prayed uh, and sought uh, sought God's uh, mercy and sought God's uh, for, you know, his forgiveness. Well, I didn't, didn't, this is one of these background passages. Draw near to the throne of grace that you may receive mercy and grace to help in your time of need. And just think, wow, you know, Hebrews 4.16 is exactly what little five-year-old Gwen needed. She needed forgiveness and she needed help in her time of need, and Jesus will help you. And uh, she bounced off, uh, and uh, the uh, day unfolded from there. Um, one of the things that uh, I thought about later was that there's actually a very intricate moral question that I had made an implicit judgment call but it was wor you know, I only thought about it years later, five years later, and I was telling this story. But there is a question that, that this raises of should she go to Anne, right? And I had made an implicit judgment call that she shouldn't, that the, the situation was done. It was a completed uh, a, a completed transaction as it was. But it's worth actually stopping and trying to, to wrestle out 
uh, is this something where she should go to Anne and repent and ask Anne's forgiveness? Or is this something that she should go to Anne and in some way raise the question or challenge Anne for being opinionated about uh, her cereal choices? And uh, I, the more I thought about it, I could not imagine any good scenarios for a five-year-old going to another five-year-old and saying, please forgive me for saying, for lying and saying I hated music like you do when really I love it. it and, and there's actually, uh, I'd, be willing to, I'd be willing to be disputed on it because these more casuistic, how do you solve it, are not easy. But, uh, but my logic in it is this was not a lie that defrauded Nan. Uh, Anne in any regard, right? If, if Gwen had stolen a toy and then had come and said, or she told the lie that uh, she had been gossiping about Anne and backbiting her and Anne raised it, and she said, oh, no, 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 no. You know? If she had told a lie that in some way had hurt Anne, it would make sense that she'd have to go and reconcile. Name what was wrong, ask forgiveness, and seek to, and with adult help, to help carry the conversation along. But uh, this struck me as one where the lesson to be learned was more in Gwen's own life. This is this wonderful eye-opening moment of understanding both her heart and God's mercy to her. And that the fact that there was no defrauding of the friend, we could leave the situation as done. Um, okay, that was vignette number one. <coughs> vignette number two. This happened about, uh, this happened two days later. This was Tuesday, and we're towards the end of school, and the, uh, there'd been a very, it was a no snow winter that winter, and they, so the school gave the kids a snow day in June just to use up one of their snow days. So Gwen is home all day, and, um, but that night there was a school play, and it was the play Little Red Riding Hood. And Gwen was Little Red Riding Hood in the kindergarten play. So she was the lead actress. And uh, she's home. I was working at home that day. And uh, she's, I don't want to go. This is stupid. Why do I have to do this play? I don't want to do it. I don't want to go. I feel sick. My tummy hurts. And I, who, you know, it takes like, green stuff coming out of thing, places in the body to tell. I, even I could tell she wasn't really sick. or there was, If she felt a tummy ache, it was psychosomatic, you know, nerves and something. And uh, so, so she's fussing and complaining and, and uh, doesn't want to go to do the play and wants to bail on it. We had another little counseling moment. Uh, and it started the same way. Honey, you know, what's up? You know, you, you've been practicing for the play, and now you're feeling upset about it. You don't want to go. Like, what's going on? And she told this very, uh, very compelling story that uh, she said, at, at the end of the play, Little Red Riding Hood and Grandma have a reunion. Now, I won't comment on the Christian elementary school deciding that Little Red Riding Hood should have a happy ending. They, they changed the story, so Grandma didn't get eaten by the wolf. But at the end, the hunter jumped in, he, he offed the wolf, and then Little Red Riding Hood and Grandma have this reunion. So we won't comment on whether we should stay true to the original story. But anyway, there's a happy ending to Little Red Riding Hood. And, and she said, and right at the end, and right when I, when I meet Grandma, Jamie was her friend. I have to hug her, and I'm afraid everybody's going to laugh. Now, this again, context, right? Uh, in this case, you've got, it's a very different kind of situation, right? Here, it's a, it's a possible future. Oh, let me put that in orange. It's a possible future situation that does not exist. We don't know it's going to happen. But it is the same kind of thing that she's dealing with. In this case, it's the possibility of laughter at her, at these two little children hugging, and the same issue 
of the human heart is coming out. The symptoms, the outward behavior, emotion, so forth, is completely different. Here it's a, here it's a psychosomatic tummy ache. It's bailing on uh, life responsibilities and something where she's the, the, uh, got the lead role. It's uh, complaining. Uh, so very different fruit, very different situation, not even a real situation, but a possible future, but the same heart brought into it. There's something in that wonderfully profound, as simple as that is profound. Uh, one of the things you see in that uh, is the way in which, as we try to understand people's behavior, feelings, thoughts, actions, how they treat people, the choices they make, one of the ways you could understand it is that occurs at the intersection between what rules your heart and what impinges on you in your world. And part of how you read your world is based on your heart too. But the actual specifics of the thorns are in a certain sense context dependent as well as obviously heart dependent. Um, we ended up having basically a rerun of the same conversation. And you, you, you see in, uh, in this kind of thing the way in which, uh, and you know, same thing, like uh, uh, I, I drew the link for her about how uh, when, we, when we matters too much to us, what someone thinks about us, uh, that it, we're tr we get trapped by that. That seemed to make sense to her. We were able to connect some of those dots for her. There were also ways where, uh, again, I identify with her. You know, I know, I know how you feel in that. Um, I remember, boy, going into public speaking things in school, I really didn't like it. Um, and, uh, you know, so she and I are on the same, you know, there's no 10 patients overtaken a five-year-old. It's not common to everyone. Uh, the, I obviously have in mind a goal that she will go uh, and fulfill the expectations of her to do the play. Um, but there's a way, we, we wanted to get there. And we got there via the exact, we used the exact same paraphrased scripture. We talked about how Jesus could help us with this. I drew some links for her. Uh, there's also some other parts. I think this helps to help normalize an understanding of what biblical counseling is. Biblical counseling is not, does not mean that every single thing you say has a Bible verse you know, footnote attached to it. I mean, there's a, biblical wisdom is just wisdom about life. And so you can talk about tons of things, and they're going to be framed biblically. But it doesn't mean that there's you know, going to be either citation or proof text standing behind everything you say. And one of the things that I think was very helpful to her was, uh, was drawing an analogy to her, uh, for her. I said, you know, you know our, your little sister Hannah, uh, who at that point was uh, two years old, you know how she'll do things sometimes and we laugh? And we're not laughing at her. We're laughing because it's, it's funny. It's, oh, actually, I left out one of the most important parts of the story. I'm sorry. Let me double back. There's another key part of the situation. Jamie is a good foot shorter than Gwen. And you know how these disparities that happened in kindergarten where Gwen was like towering, you know, 50-story building, and Jamie is this petite little grandma that comes up about to Gwen's waist. And Gwen actually had this very acute, right awareness that there was something absurd about that. And I knew Jamie, so you know, to have this towering little red riding hood, like <laughs> bending down to hug this diminutive little grandma, it was, by definition, hysterical. And so, so I, you know, I, could, I could see where her mind went, and she was actually perceiving, she was perceiving rightly that people probably would laugh. And maybe the teacher had laughed or something like that during rehearsals because it looked crazy. But uh, uh, that's important. But I said, you know how we laugh at, we'll laugh at things Hannah does, but we're not really laughing at her. It's just cute what's happening. And so we laugh. Uh, that helped her to not feel that the laughter would be personal. It wasn't meant with malice uh, towards her. Um, we asked Jesus to forgive. We asked Jesus to help. And 
tummy ache went away, the complaining went away, she uh, went off, did the play that night, the audience went into hysterics on cue, she breezed through it, uh, you know, great, you know, it, it had a wonderful outcome. Okay, that's vignette number two. Vignette number three. We are about a week later, uh, school ended, and I think it's the next Monday, uh, I'm working at home again, and I noticed, uh, Gwen was actually working in my, was, was in my office, I was taking, I was kind of half babysitting her, uh, and I noticed that she was just having this amazingly fruitful <coughs> season in her life. Uh, she had, uh, and it's one, of, it's one of those things you wish the kids would do it all the time, but she had actually set the breakfast table that morning. She had, the night before, Sunday night, she had announced on her own that she was going to give up sucking these two fingers. So she was one of these kids that didn't need a nook because she had these two in the womb, and they had been her, her comfort uh, from, from birth. Uh, and she decided that she was a big girl now and she wasn't going to suck her fingers anymore. She was working in my office with scissors and colored paper and paste and crayons, and she was making Valentine's in June for all her classmates, which was, you know, being very loving and constructive. And then the other thing I noticed about her that uh, was, was I, thought I, was qu I quite admired, was she had actually was writing a Valentine to her brother, her older brother, who it had struck me had been rather dismissive and nasty to her. And uh, so she was actually loving her enemy. In a, in a, by writing this, uh, this love note to her less than friendly older brother, on that day, less than friendly older brother. Um, so uh, again, one of these, no problems, right? I mean, here what you're seeing, you're seeing all good things. But it, good things like that are, they're moments for redemption. And uh, the... Uh, and I, I, so we had a very, we had a, the, a conversation that again started with something like, oh, honey, you seem to be in a really good mood today. What's up? And her next words were, Jesus is helping me. And then she went back to cutting uh, Valentine's. Now, you know, if you have any parental genes, like you're not satisfied with that answer. The, uh, so, the, uh, well, how's he helping you? He's helping me not be afraid of what people think about me. And then she went back to cutting Valentine's. And again, by now the parental Geiger counter is like going off the charts, you know. Well, how is he helping you do that? And she told a story about something that happened the day before on uh, Sunday. Uh, she said, well, I was at Sunday school and so there's a little situational cue. And uh, Alexis and I were cut, doing the craft. Now again, one of these places, you know, you, you saw how knowing who Anne was and what Anne said and the role that Anne played was actually critical to understanding Gwen's lie. Understanding that Jamie was a good foot shorter than Gwen was critical to understanding the tummy ache and the malingering. Understanding of who Alexis is is actually also critical because Alexis is the person that I would describe as the queen bee of the five-year-old Sunday school class. And Alexis was the one that if you were on her good side, you had just made the social register. And if you were on Alexis' bad side, like you were lower than pond scum. And so Alexis was a, was a, ver was a power person in Gwen, this little five-year-old social world. And uh, Gwen had come home on several occasions over the previous year in tears because of some snub uh, or, or dig that had happened uh, at the hands of Alexis. Uh, so Alexis is high power. He says, Alexis and I are we're doing the craft. And Alexis said, I hate Anne. Now this is interesting. It's the same Anne. Right? It's a same situation of a strong opinion, only now it's a strong opinion that is not just about a matter indifferent, whether or, much, whether or not you like cereal, but it's actually a moral issue of hostility, 
the invitation to gossip, the invitation to, to you know, judge another person. So I hate Anne. And so I said, well, I like Anne. You're stupid. <laughs> well, that's OK. I still like Anne. And I, I, I remember sitting there thinking, like, you could not have scripted that interaction. It was perfect. I mean, it's as though there's this minefield, right, where you can, you can blow that, what, ha what happens next, in a hundred different ways, and it'll blow up. You know, you can go along with, with Alexis and say, I hate Anne, too. You can fight with Alexis and get into arguing, and you're stupid, well, you're stupid, too. And you can just be a coward and not say anything and just duck. It was this perfect example of disarming candor and the liberty to not be controlled by the fear of man at the level appropriate to a five-year-old girl. Uh, well, I like Anne. You're stupid. That's OK. I still <laughs> like Anne. You know, end of conversation. Alexis, you know, the evildoer was, was quelled. You know, the mouths of evildoers were shut. And uh, what can Alexis say at that point? You know, she, all her ammo has been spent, and righteousness has triumphed in the uh, Sunday school class. The, uh... Welcome back. I trust your discussion has gone well. To finish this lesson, go to part three in your workbook. In this section, we're going to very briefly summarize the important topics of repentance and faith. These terms describe features of the Christian life for believers in their walk with Christ after conversion. Take time to study these concepts in your workbook. These are fundamental undergirding features in the change process because change has to do with moving away from our heart's sinful and wrong-headed loves and craving to uh, and cravings to being satisfied with Christ uh, and our full redemption in Him. What is repentance? It can be a scary word to some. It can conjure up pictures of haggard faces, sitting in ashes and wearing sackcloth. It sounds like a kind of self-torture, but literally repentance means a change of mind. It's usually summarized as turning because of a change of mind, turning from my sin to Christ. I have a change of mind about God, about myself, my sin, and the righteousness of Christ. Your workbook expands on these four changes. Basically, when one repents, he looks at his own sinful features and with some degree of grief, true, grief, true guilt, and regret wants to change. In contrast to repentance, faith is looking at Christ and trusting Him for His promised forgiveness and salvation. Repentance has sin in view, faith has Christ's death and forgiveness in view. They go together. Faith is a companion of repentance, but it turns in trust to look at how God has provided forgiveness and acceptance because of Christ's death. Like a coin, you need both sides or, or, or you have a counterfeit coin. And uh, if you don't have both repentance and faith, you have counterfeit conversion. Throughout the New Testament, these concepts are repeated for believers over and over. The New Testament writers often use other terms to show that repentance and faith are part of the Christian's life. Some of the familiar terms are putting off the old self, or the old man, and putting on the new self, or the new man, Ephesians 4.22. There is both repentance and faith. And in Colossians, Paul also said, put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetous. Put them all away, Colossians 3, 5, 8. The other side of the coin is prominent also. And put on the new self. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, and so forth, Colossians 3, 9 and 12, through 12. In Romans, Paul said, Let not sin reign in your mortal bodies. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, in Romans 6, 12 and 13. He also said, present your bodies as living sacrifice, Romans 12, 1. The Apostle John also instructed believers confess, to confess their sins. Anyone, John says, who either says he has not sinned or has no sin is a liar and makes Christ a liar, 1 John 9 to 11. Furthermore, he said, everyone with the hope of seeing Christ purifies himself as he is pure, 1 John 3, 3. Repentance and faith underscore everything we've said about how change happens. 
Change isn't about making someone feel better, turn over a new leaf, or have others in their lives change. It's about heart changes from something to something, from one set of heart cravings to being satisfied with Christ alone. John Calvin, one of the early leaders in the Reformation in the 16th century, said, Our life is to be a race of repentance, which we are to run throughout our lives. These are lifelong features of the Christian life. They are not only at the beginning of our spiritual pilgrimage, but they are the way we travel day by day throughout our Christian life. They are part of the continual battle we have with indwelling sin as we seek more and more change to be like Christ. All of life is repentance, Martin Luther said in the first of his 95 theses, which he nailed to the door at Wittenberg in Germany, October 31, 1517. This marked one of the important beginning points of what has become known as the Protestant Reformation. More details about faith and repentance are found in your workbook. Reflect on them for your own life and see how it pinpoints the very need for change from sin and the only true solution to change in our relationship with Christ. If you think through either of our model versions of how change happens, you can see how repentance and faith are at the very heart of the change process. They move one to turn in repentance from the vicious cycle of folly and in faith to the gracious cycle of wisdom. They lead us from the thorn bush to the cross and bring about the fruit tree. In this lesson, we've focused on applying our model for how change happens to vignettes. Some I've summarized, some Dr. Paulison described, and some you've brought to class. We've seen that the lifelong features of repentance and faith are core components of the change process. These involve turning from sin in faith, turning to Christ. In our next lesson, we'll talk about legalism, what it is, how it can be confused with the disciplines of godliness. Why is it so easy for believers to slide into a legalistic way of living?